right? If we get enough stimulation, so remember what we're looking for is to reach threshold at the axon hillock, all right? So the dendrites are bringing in um, signals from various nerves, right? At the axon hillock, it's going to summate, it's going to add up all those signals, and if we reach threshold, then the action potential is initiated. All right, so that second dotted line is threshold. We meet threshold, we initiate the action potential, depolarize, repolarize, and when it repolarizes, it goes a little bit below resting membrane level. And so at this point, we use a sodium potassium pump to re-establish resting membrane potential. Okay. The channels and the sodium potassium pump use about 50% of the ATP that is created throughout three systems for muscle contraction. So this is hugely um, energy uh, sucking, I guess, right? About 50% there. So when we are looking at the neuromuscular junction, I'm going to just go to the whiteboard here for a minute. <clears throat> okay. So coming down the motor nerve, the signal from the brain is electrical. And then we get to our synapse. So remember that the, the motor neuron synapses with the surface of the muscle, so the sarcolemma, right? So our motor unit, right? Think about our motor unit diagram. If we've got our motor nerve, then it is synapsing with multiple different muscle fibers, muscle cells, At that neuromuscular junction, the signal has to become chemical, right? Because electricity can't jump the gap there, okay? So we have an electrical signal in the motor nerve, in the motor neuron, a chemical signal across the neuromuscular junction, and then another, if we reach threshold, another electrical signal because an action potential will be stimulated on the surface of the muscle and the action potential will run across the sarcolemma. Okay? So this chemical portion here is the neurotransmitter. In the case of the neuromuscular junction, that neurotransmitter is ACH, right? But generally, when we look at neurotransmitters throughout the body, they fall into one of two types. They can either be excitatory, in which case, if there's enough and we meet threshold, the next membrane will depolarize. Or they can be inhibitory, which prevents depolarization because it encourages um, potassium to leave the cell and then we don't get the, the correct balance to initiate the action potential. Right? So our chemical neurotransmitter can be excitatory or inhibitory. In the case of the neuromuscular junction, acetylcholine is excitatory. because we want to stimulate a contraction in the muscle.
which would just go back to love. Okay, any questions? Here. We understand the threshold idea and depolarization, repolarization, and resting membrane potential. Right, you can see how quick this whole thing happens. Right? So for that portion of the membrane takes less than two milliseconds to move that action potential along that portion of the membrane. Okay. okay, so when we're looking at the conduction of motor impulses in particular, we've got to also consider the myelin sheath that is wrapped around the motor nerve. All right, because that plays a huge role in how well we can move, how quickly we can respond to uh, stimuli. Okay. So the myelin sheath <coughs> is um, a fatty substance that wraps around the axon of the motor nerve. And it's not constant all the way down. It has little gaps in it. And the gaps are called the node of Ranvier. And that allows the impulse to be transmitted by a saltatory conduction rather than just moving along the whole length of the, um, of the axon. All right? So local conduction is used for nerves that aren't myelinated. And this saltatory, this jumping action is used for um, myelinated nerves. Okay. So there's lots of advantages to this. Let's have a look here. Alright, so here's my nerve. Oops. Here's my nerve, and here's my myelin sheath. Right. And then there's a little gap, and there's another piece of myelin. Another gap, and another piece of myelin. All right. So when we're looking, this here is the node of Ranvier. Okay. So what happens? on a myelinated nerve is that the action potential can't occur where the myelin is wrapping around and kind of covering up the sodium and potassium channels. So it jumps to the next gap in the myelin. So it jumps to the next node and it can travel along that piece of the axon and then it jumps round to the next node, travels along there and jumps, right? So this dramatically speeds up how quickly that impulse can move down a motor nerve. So um, I've always heard 150 times up to 150 times faster, um, although I was checking the chapter today, earlier today, and it says up to 50. But it's a lot, right? It really, really, really speeds up how fast this impulse can travel from the spinal column to the muscle tissue. Which is good when you think about how quickly we need to be able to react and contract muscles for motor skills, particularly sports skills, right? <clears throat> okay, so not only can it speed up how quickly the electrical signal can move from the central nervous system to the muscle, but also think back to what I said, the channels and the uh, sodium-potassium pump 
use about 50% of the ATP. So by not having to move all the way down the nerve, right, we also conserve ATP for the actual contraction. Okay, so how do we control force production, right? Um, because we don't just turn on all these motor units, right? Each motor unit gets turned on kind of separately. So how does the brain know which ones to turn on? Right? What's, is there a rule involved to help the brain um, with force production? Right? So we have, pardon me, we have um, what we call the size principle of motor recruitment. Okay? And the size principle says that motor units are recruited from the smallest to the largest based upon the size of the neuron, okay, so remember that type 2 muscle fibers are in an FFR or an FF motor unit, right? Those motor nerves in those types of units are larger and thicker than the motor nerves that are in an S motor unit that is synapsing with type 1 muscle fibers. Okay, so the S motor unit has a smaller cell body and a narrower, the diameter is much less of that motor neuron in that unit. All right, so that means a couple of things. It means that if we look at the summation of the signal at the axon hillock, if it's a smaller nerve and the diameter of the axon is smaller, it's quicker to reach threshold in that type of motor unit. Right? And the bigger the cell body and the larger the diameter of the axon, the slower it takes to reach threshold. So that means that we go from the smallest to the largest. We recruit slow motor units before we recruit FFR and FF motor units. Right? That allows the brain to regulate force production. Okay? How many motor units do I turn on? And what's the size of the motor unit that I turn on? Okay. So what we have. Flipping backwards and forwards here between the whiteboard. <clears throat> what we have is a rule that says we're going to turn on one. Right. Then oops, to A, uh oh, did I do that? One, then to A, and then to X. Typically, all right, so the smallest slow motor unit, right, so this is a slow, oops, this is fast fatigue resistant, right, and then lastly we turn on fast fatigable, alright, now it's interesting when we look at this idea because type 2 muscle fibers 
have the most potential to grow in size. So we see the greatest hypertrophy um, in type 2 fibers, given the correct training program. All right. So that's quite interesting because that means then that if I am just jogging for my aerobic work, right? If I'm jogging, I'm probably only turning on type 1 fibers, so I'm turning on S motor units. Okay? And those are the ones that have the least capability of growing in size. So jogging or lifting very light weights and doing reps doesn't build large muscles, right? So I think that that's an important idea to take on board because depending what, um, what kind of job you want when you leave college, right, what your career path is, we get a lot of misunderstanding about muscle hypertrophy in the general population, right? So, you know, your sister or your aunt or whoever says, oh, I'm not going to lift weights because I don't want big muscles. But you can only get big muscles if you lift heavy, heavy weights, right? Because they're the ones that would turn on those other types of motor units that stimulate a type 2, type 5, right? So if I use light weights and I do reps, and if I jog or I walk, I don't get big muscles, right? So again, think about what does a 100 meter sprinter look like compared to a 10,000 meter runner, right? Just <coughs> visualize the difference in those two body types, right? A sprinter has big thighs and biggish calves, right? And they've got lots of muscle mass around their upper body and their arms. And a 10,000 meter runner is very small and lean, right? Doesn't mean that they're weak, it means they train a different muscle fiber type. So the, no, let me do the exception first. So, okay, so we have this principle, this rule. We go type 1, type 2A, type 2X, right? Slow, FFR, FF, typically. All right, well, think about what that means in a sporting context. Right? What if I'm a, a sprint swimmer, right? And we're on the blocks, and the gun or the whistle or whatever, the signal is to go, and I have to contract my slow muscles, and then my fastish muscles, and then my really powerful muscles in order to jump off the block. Right? That wouldn't be very efficient, would it? Right? Think about what happens um, in everyday life. Right? If you've got to lift a couch or a big cupboard or something, right? I don't have to wait to generate force. So there are instances, we often hear stories about the woman who backed the car over the baby's pram and then jumps out of the car and all of a sudden she's strong enough to lift the car up so that the baby can crawl out, right? Can she lift the car up? No. <laughs> right? So there are times when we can ignore the size principle, right? We are able to train, that's why sprint athletes of any description spend a lot of time training 
that start, right? Because we can train our brain to avoid the size principle, right? Just jump straight to the more powerful muscles straight away. I want to get out of those blocks as fast as I can. So can override the size principle, but typically the size principle is, what's, is what occurs, okay? So there's benefits to that, because if I'm going to use my easily, easily recruited motor units first, right? Then, and they happen to be the ones that are <coughs> fatigue resistant because they use oxidative phosphorylation to make ATP, right? Then that means that for daily living activities or for endurance type activities, we use predominantly those type 1 muscle fibers that can keep going for a long time, right? If I'm pushing the hoover, the um, vacuum around the house. Okay. Boring as it is, unless I have my headset on, and then I'm boogieing with my vacuum, right? I can do that for a long time if I have to. Okay? Try not to, but I can. Okay? Because I'm using predominantly type 1 slow motor units. Then we have to understand that this threshold idea, right? If the motor unit reaches threshold, so if the motor neuron that is responsible for that unit of muscle fibers reaches threshold at the axon hillock, those muscle fibers will contract, right? They'll be activated. If we don't get enough signal coming in to reach threshold, then the muscle fibers won't be activated. Right? It's called the all or none law. And again, it gives the brain some control over the amount of force production that's occurring. It's also a big part of the learning curve between a beginner and a competent or more than competent elite athlete. Okay. So, here's our order of recruitment. Okay. We're going to recruit our slow motor units first. If that amount of force can't get the job done, we turn on FFR, motor units. And if necessary, we can turn on FF motor units to get the job completed. Questions? Are you there, Chris? I saw you were reconnecting. You having internet issues? I can't hear you at all. He got home. He just got home. He got home. Oh, okay. Gotcha. All right. Okay. Any questions on conduction? It's quite a lot of different variables, different factors that are involved in efficient conduction of um, motor impulses. Right? So 
you know, when, when you look at someone who's highly coordinated doing this ridiculously complex motor skill in the middle of a game or, or you know, a gymnast, just imagine what is going on to try for that to happen, right? It's quite mind-boggling, I think. Okay, so we need to look at adaptations then. Remember, again, always adaptations are typically positive. Not always, but typically positive. And the system will adapt to be more efficient, more effective at the job you're asking it to do. All right? So we're going to look at the difference between strength power type training and what the adaptations are to that, and then what are the adaptations to endurance aerobic type training. All right? So um, when we look at strength power athletes, we see some remodeling at the neuromuscular junction. Um, we see an increase in the size of the vesicles that um, hold the acetylcholine. All right? And we also see an increase in the size or dimension of the receptor sites, the other side of the neuromuscular junction on the sarcolemma for the acetylcholine to attach to. All right? So that's good because that means I can move that signal across more quickly, all right? So about maybe 15% increase in adaptation at the neuromuscular junction, right? So that's pretty useful. Then we see um, an increased contractile response. So neural drive um, is initiated in the central nervous system and it's the um, combination of how many motor units am I recruiting and how quickly am I activating those motor units, all right? So here we see an increase in the ability to alter the rate of action potential generation, right? I can generate action potentials faster, um, so that leads to improved activation of muscle tissue, all right? So we get the action potential to the sarcolemma and down the T-tubules to the sarcoplasmic reticulum faster. And probably more efficient recruitment pattern. And that's the one that, that is likely to be the primary reason the primary um, reason that we see this increased contractile response is that the brain gets better at turning on motor units at the right time in the skill. Okay. So if we take a beginner and we put them on a resistance training program, all right, it's so on a strength program. Given motivation by the individual that started the program, given that they stick to the program, all right? So if I give um, my brother-in-law a training program and week one, he's gonna go to the gym twice and week two, he's gonna go to the gym three times. By week three, I would see quite a difference in his strength. All right? You might, if you get the program right, see a difference even in week one. It would be pretty small, right? But we see a change in strength very quickly when you start a resistance program, right? Do I see a change in muscle size very quickly if someone starts a training program? No, right, good Chris, you don't, right? It takes donkeys to, for the muscles to actually grow and get bigger, okay? So 
then that's an interesting question, right? If the muscle hasn't grown, hasn't hypertrophied, hasn't laid down more protein filaments, how come I'm stronger? Right? So this graph, I love this graph, because I think it really gives you a, a great picture of what is going on here. So here's time in weeks along the bottom along X and progress in strength on Y, all right? And we've got naught to eight weeks here, okay? The green line at the bottom represents hypertrophy. So by the end of eight weeks, we've only got a little bit of hypertrophy occurring, and it took, what's that, at least three weeks to start, okay? The blue line is my measure of strength, all right? So by eight weeks, I'm quite considerably stronger than I was at week zero, right? But it isn't because of my muscle hypertrophy. What we see is this upregulation in the neural system, right? The neural drive from the central nervous system is much stronger very quickly. And that plays the largest part in the initial strength gains that we see. Right? Now, after eight weeks, neural drive kind of plateaus and doesn't change very much. It's done its adaptation. And so our continued strength gain is now reliant on growth in muscle tissue. That makes sense. Okay. Similarly, if we have a period of detraining, so I'm injured or I uh, got bored with that training program or I decided I want to go play tennis instead of go to the gym, or I'm on holiday and I can't get to a gym, whatever, right? So we have a period of detraining for whatever reason. The declines that we see in strength, and we see declines in strength relatively quickly, not as quickly as cardiovascular, but quite quickly if we take time off. Those declines are due to a decrease in neural drive from the central nervous system, not a shrinking of the muscle tissue. Once you've built muscle tissue, it takes ages to get rid of it again, right? But does it stay as strong as it was when you were training? Oh no. So this neural drive idea is very important when we're looking at adaptation to training programs. Okay, a couple more adaptations that we see within strength and power training. We increase motor unit firing, okay? So what we're looking for is synchronization of motor units. Well, that makes sense, I think, right? If I've got four motor units and I turn on two of them, I'm not gonna create as much force production as if I turn on three or four of them, okay? And I don't want to turn them on haphazardly. I want all of them to turn on at the same time so I create the most amount of force at that point in time. 
Okay, so we're looking for synchronization of the motor units. Right. Remember though that those motor units that I'm going to use for strength and power work fatigue very quickly. Right. So I can't turn them on for very long at any one go. When we look at elite power athletes, and I think a lot of the studies, if I remember rightly, a lot of the studies have been done in Olympic rowers. Um, the recruitment patterns change during the event, right? So while they're, while they're doing their race or while they're training, the recruitment pattern, which set of motor units gets turned on, will change because they fatigue so fast. So I don't turn the whole lot on at one go because then I only get 10 feet in the race, right? So I turn a block on and then that block gets fatigued, I turn another block on. So again, part of the skill that we see in an elite rower versus a beginner rower is this unconscious learning that the brain is doing with force production. Okay? Now, if we look at endurance training, we look at aerobic athletes, we see a different picture. Okay? At the neuromuscular junction, we also see adaptation as we did with the strength and power, but we see more adaptation. All right, that neuromuscular junction is a site of fatigue. Well, if I'm an endurance athlete and I'm creating all this ATP through an energy system that doesn't get fatigued, it's not a lot of help if my neuromuscular junction is fatigued, right? So they see a large increase in the number of um, little pockets at the end of the axon that hold the ACH called a vesicle. And they also see a large increase in the number of ACH receptors on the muscle surface. All right. So in um, strength power athletes, we see an improvement of maybe 15% um, efficiency at that neuromuscular junction. In an endurance trained person, that could be 30%, um, 35%. All right. So it's quite a lot more adaptation at the neuromuscular junction for an aerobic athlete than a power athlete. Okay. That's good because that decreases my chance of that neuromuscular junction fatiguing. Okay. The other thing we see in endurance trained athletes is again an adaptation in the recruitment of the motor units, but it's a totally different adaptation to what we see in the strength and power athletes, all right? Because I want this muscle to be able to contract for several hours without stopping, right? Not just several minutes, okay? So instead of developing synchronous motor unit recruitment, it develops asynchronous motor unit recruitment, right? So let me see if I can draw that a little bit to help you out. Okay. So I've got my motor unit. My muscle fibers, and I've got another motor unit attaching to some different muscle fibers, and I have another one and because we're doing aerobic work. We're riding our bicycle, we're walking at the trail, or we're jogging at the trail, okay? 
we're going to assume that all these motor units are S, okay, and they're synapsing with type 1 fibers. Okay. So what we see with endurance work is that the recruitment pattern gets more and more asynchronous. Okay? If I turn both these units on and they both get tired at the same time, it's going to be hard to continue jogging. So what we do as we get better, as we train harder, right, and we're more consistent with our training and we've got weeks, months, years of training under us, the brain learns to turn this one on first. Right? Then it turns this one on and turns that one on. Then it turns this one on and turns that one off. By which point it can turn that one off and turn this one back on again. Does that make sense? Right? Because I don't need very much power at any one time because I'm doing aerobic work, I don't need to turn on the motor units at the same time to create power. I need to make sure I can turn on motor units for a long time. Questions on adaptation. As I've said before, I think if you understand the process, right, and the principles and the theories behind the process, then the adaptations are relatively logical, right? I'm going to adapt this process in a way that makes me better at it. Um, the synchronous asynchronous thing takes a little bit of practice, I think, so make sure that you review that several times to really understand what's happening there. Okay, last little bit. How do we use this information? All right, so we've got to keep thinking about our specificity of training. I have to train the system, and now we're looking at multiple systems, in the way that it needs to be used for the performance I'm looking for, right? So the type of training I do is going to decide which motor units I turn on and which motor units I don't turn on, right? And how much muscle fiber is contracted and how much muscle fiber isn't contracted. So I have to make sure that I'm lining up that training program very closely to what I need for the best performance I can do. Okay. The biomechanical position of the muscle and the insertion can impact force production, remember. So, you know, motor units are going to be recruited based on exercise demand and the types of um, mechanics. So if I use a leg press machine and I'm lying in the leg press machine kind of in, in a V shape, I'm going to turn on different motor units than if I do a standing squat. Right? Well, which action do I need for the movement I want to be good at? Right? Okay. So the only way to move as a human and to do all these amazing things we can do is to activate and train the neuromuscular system.
right? So this combination, the fact that they have to talk to each other constantly all the time is the only way we get to move. If they can't talk to each other, we can't move this skeleton. Okay? That's it for chapter five, questions. Friday will be a review, right, for the skeletal muscle system and the nervous system. Monday will be the exam. Tomorrow I have office hours from 1 till 3. So if you have any questions or you want me to go over something before Friday, by all means come ask. Okay? And then on Friday, we'll see how we're going to run that review session. It'll depend a little bit on how many of you come into the review. All right? Okay, have a good afternoon.